So my name is uh, Thibaut Salam, and I'm going to present our work on inspecting the internal logic of recurrent neural nets. Uh, this is a collaboration with Kevin Lin, Ian Huang, Carl von Drick, and Eugene Wu, all from Columbia University. So nowadays, neural nets are everywhere. Uh, we're using them to manage data centers. We even talk about using them to monitor patients in hospital. So if this trend is going to continue, we'd better make sure that they work. And if we want to make sure that they work, we'd better make sure that we understand how they work. So how do we understand how neural nets work? So there is a common conception that neural nets are a black box. So we read this a lot in the literature. But are they really? Um, in practice, we, we have access to every little parameter. In practice, we can actually measure every little activation. So our view is that no, actually neural nets are not really black boxes. In fact, they are totally transparent. And yet, despite this, they surprise us all the time. So uh, not so long ago, I was talking with a colleague at uh, Columbia who was uh, working on a humor detection. So she had built this classifier that could actually detect jokes in uh, videos along with the uh, text. And actually, the thing did pretty well on, uh, on test. So we couldn't think for a while, how would such a classifier work? So a possibility is that you look at keywords. So it counts n-grams or trigrams or bigrams. Uh, another possibility would be that it tries to infer what general topic the, the dialogue is, is about, because perhaps some topics are funnier than others. Or perhaps it didn't even care about the topics. You just look at the video because, well, perhaps people who do jokes tend to move up a lot. So how disappointing my friend was when she realized that the classifier actually cared about none of that stuff, and all he was interested in was volume over time. So what she had actually built was a very expensive system to detect when the volume was loud, because there was some problem in her, uh, it's not a problem, some characteristic actually in her, in her train set, and every punch loud was a little bit louder than the rest. So <clears throat> this kind of effect actually happens all the time. Uh, what happened there is that the model actually found a variable that is correlated with the target variable, so with the stuff that you want to predict, but it has nothing to do with the task. And it's particularly sneaky because it's very hard to detect. So how is it possible that we have all of this information about neural net, we have all of this data, we can measure everything, and yet we understand so little? So to answer this question, we can uh, take a step back and think about code uh, in general. How do we understand code? So one of the great ideas of uh, software engineering is this idea of uh, uh, abstraction layers, basically. So uh, when engineers work with code, they don't think about it like a big soup of assembly code. No, they think about it in terms of layers, basically. Uh, at the bottom, we have bits, so a lot of details. On the other side of the spectrum, we have functionalities. And in between, we have a lot of stuff. We have functions, we have libraries, we have classes. So those layers are great because they hide the complexity. If you're just interested in bits, you don't have to worry about functionalities. If you just care about functionalities, you don't have to worry about the bits. And for every single one of those layers, there's a whole ecosystem of tools that we can use to uh, understand code and to make sure that it works. So for bits, we can use performance counters. I'm sure a lot of people uh, here are into that kind of stuff. Uh, for functions, uh, we can play some assertions. Uh, we can do some unit tests. For functionalities, we can do more end-to-end -end testing. We can even do user studies. So now let's take a look at neural nets. What happens there? So at the bottom of the stack, we have tensors. So here we understand pretty well what's going on. So there's a great tools now to step through computation graph and look at the math. So it's basically a linear, linear algebra. There's no mystery here. On the other side of the spectrum, we talk about the model like a predictor. We say, oh, it's doing classification, it's doing regression, but we don't really care about what's going on there. So at this level, we have all the metrics, F1, precision, um, accuracy, recall, uh, perplexity, you name it. So we can also do some uh, perturbation analysis. So perturbate the input a little bit, see how the output changes. And nowadays there's a growing um, body of literature on how to understand black box models. So, but all of those methods are end to end. Um, and in the between, what do we have? Well, things here are a little bit more uh, complicated. So what is the function uh, of a neural net, basically? Uh, did the model learn some concept? Is there some logic there? So we don't really know. So the thing is that we don't have the nice intermediate abstractions of software engineering. And because we don't have those nice abstractions, we don't have those nice tools, nice tools that we can use to understand code. So there's uh, an opportunity out there. It is to take all the functionalities that software engineering tools give us to understand code 
and to have the same functionalities to understand neural nets. So uh, think about it. Uh, if we had abstractions for neural nets, we would have a better way to, to describe models. We could focus on what they do internally, the internal logic, not on how they were implemented. Perhaps we can also put some assertions, and uh, th this would help us find uh, bugs easier. Perhaps we can even have some kind of modularity if we could take a piece of a model for one task and put it in another model for another task. But we're not there yet. We believe that the reasons why we're not there yet is because there is no easy way to take a big model, so like this big white box here, and to decompose it into smaller logical components that those little boxes there. So in the case of code, it's very easy because we build the code. So we can enforce this hierarchy. We build those components. But neural nets don't work like this. They don't work like this because we train them end to end, and in the end, we can never really be sure what they learn. In fact, we don't even know if those logical components exist. So how can we check that a model contains logical components? Um, deep neural inspection, so DNI, is the primitive that we envision to do this. So a DNI takes two inputs. Uh, it takes a train model, so like this uh, big white box here. And it takes a lot of a smaller hypothesis function, so like the little colored boxes there. So what is a hypothesis function? It's a piece of Python code, which is provided by developers, which in effect encode a hypothesis about what the model could be doing. So for instance, our train model is a system to detect humor. Uh, perhaps the yellow box here could be something that looks for keywords, like ha ha ha. Or perhaps like the, the, the green box here uh, could be some function that detects exclamation point. It would return one if there's an exclamation mark and zero otherwise. Perhaps the red box there could be something that tracks volume over time. It can be anything as long as you, um, as long as you can write it in Python. So the output of a system is basically a series of scores that will tell you to what extent a subset of the model replicates the logics uh, of those functions. So basically, a deep neural inspection answers two questions. Uh, first of all, does the model learn these logics? And if so, so second question, where? So which uh, hidden units within the model work together to replicate uh, the functionality of those functions? So the first instantiation of, uh, of, of this system, is, of this idea is a system uh, called Luigi. Uh, so to answer the question of review two, uh, we call it Luigi because it looks at uh, actually pipes and a connection all the time. So it's kind of a plumber, but it's not yet a first class plumber, so we didn't want to call it Mario. Okay, then I'm happy this is clear. Um, so to illustrate how Luigi works, let's look at uh, an example. So we created a, a simple model that can take expressions, uh, logical expressions uh, uh, like this one, and evaluate them. So in this case, we have one or zero and one or one. The system would return one. So the idea was to see just in general uh, would uh, recurrent neural nets uh, generalize. So our model is pretty simple. Uh, it's an LSTM with uh, one layer and four hidden units. So it looks a bit like this. So uh, basically, if I simplify it, um, the layer takes two inputs. It takes the uh, character at the current time step and the output of itself in the past. So the question that we had is, what does this model do? What did it learn? So to answer this, we can uh, visualize its activation over time. So this is what we do here. So the wiggly line here is basically the activation over time of the first hidden unit as it reads every input character. So on the x-axis, we have the input sequence, one or zero and so on and so forth. So what can we see here? Well, not much. There seem to be some kind of wiggles. Uh, we see that the hidden uh, unit seems to output higher values when you see numbers, maybe lower values when you see operators. So we could assume that well, it's, it's having some kind of concept of number and operator, but honestly, we know nothing. We can take a look at the larger picture, which is basically all four uh, activations, because we have four, uh, four hidden units. And then things get even more confusing. So we find it quite interesting because even on a simple model like this, we cannot just look at the activation and understand what's going on. We have to make some guesses. So we had all kind of ideas. Uh, one, uh, one idea that we had was that the model was counting. It's counting the number of one, it's counting the number of zeros, and it returns y if it sees lots of one or zero if it sees lot, lots of zeros. That's a possibility. Another strategy that it could do, so it's another idea that we had, was that maybe it just learns the training state by heart and that every time it sees a new example, it tries to match it to something that it has seen before. That's another possibility. Finally, another other possibility is that it learns some kind of algorithm, some kind of computer program, basically. So all of those possibilities uh, can be encoded as a hypothesis function to be checked by Luigi, actually. So in this case, for this experiment, we focused on the last idea. We wanted to check if the model had actually learned an algorithm. 
So we uh, manually wrote this little finesse state machine that could solve the same task. So uh, it would take this string here and give you the good answer. And it could edit it in, as a Python function. So that's our feature function. It's there at the bottom, basically. So you can see on the x-axis, we have the input character. And every little block tells you the state that the finesse state machine is in after reading each character. The question that we have is, does the model behave like this hypothesis function? So in this case, one thing that Luigi can do is to use logistic regression. It's very simple. It's, it, so it takes some logistic regression over the four hidden state there, and it turns out that it can predict with 99% accuracy what are going to be the blocks at the bottom there. So this gives us some evidence. Of course, it's not the end of the story. There's more analysis to be done. But this gives us some evidence that our recurrent neural net seems to behave like this finite state machine. And then, in effect, the model learns some little algorithm. So in this case, we created a hypothesis function from a finite state machine. But we could have used anything else. We could have used bigrams. We could have used a counter. We could have used something that's based on syntax. We could even have used another model, actually. What's interesting here is that, in effect, Luigi um, introduced an intermediate level of abstraction. So now we don't talk about what the model does in terms of tensors. We don't talk about it in terms of predictor. We, we talk about it in terms of uh, functionality. Yeah, so obviously we're really excited about this work, and we believe that we can build a whole stack uh, on top of Luigi. So Luigi sits at the bottom, it's the primitive, it's the plumber. Um, so the input of Luigi is hypothesis functions. So the obvious next step in our research is going to be to understand uh, how to generate uh, those hypothesis functions and where they come from. Once we have this, then we will have the basics to provide a whole software engineering tooling to help people understand models. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening to me. If you're interested in a topic, you can come to me or you can come to Kevin who sits there. This is a bit of an advertisement for the Wulab for my own website. Thanks a lot. <laughs>